we're going to cover the support for GA Unit 5 in IntelliJ IDEA 2016.2. We're going to cover the changes to the debugger. We'll cover the changes to version control. We'll cover inspections, the editor, a couple of editor changes, some small UI changes, and then we'll cover um, changes to database tools and the JavaScript changes that have gone into IntelliJ IDEA. Uh, there's the one thing we won't be covering, which usually falls under an IntelliJ slash Java webinar, is the spring changes because there's a webinar specifically to cover that. So we won't cover that in this one. So moving straight ahead, the first thing I'd like to cover is the support for JUnit 5. I haven't talked about this in one of the screencasts yet, and we haven't covered it in any depth in a blog post yet. So this is this is quite new information that I'm going to be sharing with you guys. So IntelliJ IDEA 2016.2 does come with support for the brand shiny new JUnit 5. Now, most of us um, as Java developers should have been using JUnit probably for, for many, many years. And the new version is, going, is quite eagerly awaited and could involve quite a few changes to the way that we the way that we run tests, the way that we think about tests. So it's quite nice to see that IntelliJ supports it already, even though it's still in a state of development. So let me show you what some of that looks like. So, this is an example JUnit 5 test. This is a kind of fairly simple, straightforward example where we have a test annotation, but this is the new test annotation, not the, not the old one. And I'm using the display name annotation as well. I'll, show, I'll run these tests so you can see A, that it works, and B, what that looks like. So you can see that when we run this, JUnit Jupyter is the, the new JUnit 5 runner. Um, you can see that it actually outputs the display name of the test rather than the, the test method name. So you should be able to see in the results of the test when you run them, you should be able to see a, a useful um, description of the test that, that ran, whether it passed or failed. Uh, another thing which is new in JUnit 5 is this ability to assert all and run a number of assertions in a single block. And that's supported in, in IntelliJ IDEA as well. Uh, another example of, of this, let's have a look at this one. JUnit 5 allows you to nest these test cases. So what I've done here is I've nested them as a kind of um, uh, in a given when and then style way. These inner classes are a specific set of specifications. So in this case, any happy messages, as opposed to any sad messages. And then inside those, we've got nested tests as well. So I'll show you what this looks like when it runs. And you can see the nested specifications here. So you see the when, and then you see a series of should, shoulds. So this is all fully supported in um, IntelliJ IDEA 2016.2. Uh, JUnit 5 is currently under development, as is the support for JUnit 5. So you'll see some of these things, um, you'll see them changing and improving as these things go on. But for now, just be aware of the fact that if you do want to start playing with JUnit 5, it is supported fully inside the IDE. So that's that. Yes, the, the new annotations that's supported from JUnit 5 and the display of the results. Next thing I want to cover while we're sort of on the testing um, area is I want to cover the changes and improvements to the debugger. We have merged the watches and variables windows and we've added multi-line um, expression support in a bunch of different places. So let's take a quick look at those things. So firstly, let me find a test to run. If I debug this, Now inside the variables window, you can add a watch expression if you want. If you want a separate window for your watches, you can still bring that up and have that in a separate window if you like, or you can merge them all into a single place. So let's see, for example, here we might want to add a new watch, for example. And then you can see all of your watches in the same window as all of the variables as they change. This is quite useful. This means that we don't have to have a number of different places to look at what the state of various things are. But as I said, you can still have the separate things if you want to. 
the other main change here is the support for multi-line expressions. So if we look, if we right-click on this breakpoint, we can add a condition, a condition so that this breakpoint will only stop under certain circumstances. This this now supports multi-line expressions. So here, let's say we want to support, we want to stop at this breakpoint when this particular condition is met. This allows you to build up a, a more complex expression to evaluate, to decide whether or not you want to stop at this breakpoint. And by having this uh, multi-line expression, if we enable that, then we should see it still stops there under those circumstances. The other places where this has been added are, if we go over here, we can also, in evaluate and log, we can add a multi-line expression as well. So here, maybe I want to log what that length of that array was. I can, I can put that here, that's enabled. And then when I run this, let me get to the results. You'll see the you'll see that expression logged here. And the final place which supports multi-line expressions are um, uh, is in the custom data type renderers. So I'll bring that up using actions. Now, data type renderers are allow a way to, for you to tell the IDE what information you want to show about a particular type when, for example, you're debugging. So if I want to have a look at what this Twitter connection thing is, what, what expression do I use to decide on how to display that? So here, again, we have this multi-line expression. I'm going to use a string, a string builder to build up a descriptive string for this particular object. It might be that I don't want to... It might be that I don't want to override two string to provide a pretty string for this object. I might want to provide a custom string for the ID to display this. So here I've, I've added this here um, and let me show you how that works. So if I enable that, I'll go to somewhere which is using that. So that was this Twitter connection object. And when I debug this, You can see, let's remove that watch because I don't need it anymore. You can see this Twitter connection is using my custom expression to display the information about it. Okay, so that's the, the two main features of the changes that have happened to the debugger, the watches and variables being merged and multi-line expression support being extended to a number of different places. Um, are there any questions at this point? Um, yeah, we have uh, a couple of questions, um, and um, the first one is about uh, some uh, very specific problem uh, regarding Spring MVC support. Um, mm -hmm. So, um, at the moment, I believe it's better to be reported to our tracker because um, I can't say uh, for sure why it happens uh, without uh, taking a look at the actual code. So, yeah, I would suggest to go to the tracker and check if there is already existing issue about that or just report it and, and we'll, we'll do our best to get it fixed. So, another question is about... Kotlin, are any, uh, any new features in uh, 2016.2 for Kotlin? Um, not much, but there are a few, uh, a couple of features actually um, going to um, uh, will make it to the newest update. Um, so um, in you know EP uh, built in for 2016.2.1, you already can uh, try the um, uh, new Kotlin plugin version updated to 1.0.3. Uh, so the new features are uh, a little bit smarter code completion. So now it respects um, some very specific statements like by and in and um, suggests smarter um, completion. Uh, they're, all, they're also um, available the new action move elements right and left 
previously added for Java. So now it will work for Kotlin. And Kotlin byte code tool window also get a decompile button. So you can decompile your uh, byte code and see the Kotlin source code. And I believe there will be more, so stay tuned. And um, the second question is about um, inspections and um, the problem pain. So um, the question is, shall we, yeah. Should we cover that when we once we've gone over the inspections uh, uh, changes in, um, in case that answers it? I, I think I can answer it now because it doesn't relate to the new feature. So it, it basically asks if um, we could in IntelliJ IDEA show problems uh, related to not only op currently open file but, but all files in the project, uh, for, for example, like Eclipse does. And we do have such plans and uh, we considering uh, such option. Um, it, it's not ready yet, so I really hope to see it myself. Uh, so far, you could enable the automatic compilation in your compiler setting, and you'll see the, the problems tool window. And it may probably uh, be what you uh, actually need, but still we have uh, we have plans for adding uh, better support for that. So, but it is just not ready yet. And Another question is about when the spring related webinar will gonna be. So uh, I think I'll just send a link. It it's gonna be in 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 a few days. And it's on Monday, right? On the first. Yeah. I think. Yeah. Yeah. And another question is whether the debugger improvements eventually make their way into PyCharm also. Yeah, for sure. So PyCharm is about to be released, right, very soon, and it will get all the platform improvements from IntelliJ IDEA. And I, I think that's it for now. Okay, great. So I'll move on to the next thing, which is the changes to version control. So there have been some small improvements to version control. Um, well, I shouldn't, I shouldn't say small improvements. I don't know how much effort it took to, to implement them, but in terms of from a user's point of view, there are some nice, there are nice, some nice changes to version control, which are not a massive impact, but just change the way you work a little bit. Firstly, what I think um, has probably addressed to some of my frustrations. Let me just open the right project for this. Is the the log window has a number of improvements. So in the version control log, the, the performance of this window is just much, much better than it used to be. The, the changes get loaded in the background. And so rather than in the past, something I noticed is that when you come to this window, it takes a little while to load. Um, now I find that the loading is much, much quicker. There's also an updated progress bar, which appears underneath these buttons here when it's loading some changes. But I've only seen that about twice since the new update because the changes get loaded so quickly that the performance of this screen is much, much better. Um, another change in here is that if we want to select more than one commit, so like this with a few files, some information, uh, and a commit here with some different files, when we select both those commits, we can see the combined value of those commits. We can see both the messages and we can see all the files that changed. That's quite a nice way of seeing, you know, if you want to take a quick look at some changes on a branch, how much was changed in, in, in those individual commits. And another quick change is the ability to navigate using Command L. Um, if you're wondering which shortcuts I'm using, they're always down at the bottom of the screen. Uh, Command L or Control L for Windows and Linux takes you into the search box. So then I can type the search and find out any messages which, oops, I spelled Lambda wrong, Lambda find any commits which mention lambdas, for example. One area that's had quite a lot of improvements are around applying patches. So for a start, there's a couple of different ways of applying these patches. Firstly, if we had something like, if we drag our patch into the IDE window, it will, oh. <laughs> live coding, live demos are always a disaster. 
that's it just waiting to happen. It should, let's try it again. Okay. Um, it will open up the apply patch uh, dialog just from dragging the patch into the window and then you can apply that patch. You can also, that's the, the patch is a text value. You can also, if you have one of these things open, if I select the contents of this and then the move the focus back to the IDE, I haven't had to press anything, I haven't had to do anything, it will just automatically try and apply that patch. Now this is particularly useful if someone emails you a patch or if you see a patch file on a, on a web application or something like that, where you don't want to download the physical file, you've just got it on the clipboard. This is quite an effective way to apply those patches. And one of the other things that's happened around applying patches is that IntelliJ has just got that much smarter about applying these patches. Uh, for example, here it tells me I have a missing base file because this file um, was renamed since the patch was created. So I can select that. Um, I can select the updated file if I want to. It will try and do a number of things automatically for you so that you don't have to do those kinds of manual steps as well. I haven't been able to reproduce every single circumstance under which these patches can be uh, now magically applied. But if you do, if you are in the process of, of applying patches regularly, you should see some improvements in this area. And uh, one of the other changes I quite like is, let's open up this file here. If I create a new file, let's call it the file. And if I forget to add it to Git or decide at the beginning I'm not going to add it to Git, when I actually go and try and commit any changes, I can now see in here all my unversion files. So if I forgot to commit this file, if I forgot to add it to Git, um, or if it came from another system, perhaps, I, I, perhaps this file was added not through IntelliJ, it will allow you to select these new files so you don't accidentally uh, forget to commit maybe generated files and so on and so forth. So let's commit that. And another change is that case-only renames have, um, they, they work the way that you expect them to work on both um, the Mac and on Windows. So I'm using a Mac here. So let's say I rename this file, but I call it the file, just with a different case. When I refactor that, So let's see that, that's got the new name. This gets committed correctly. If we go back to the log, we can see we have the two files for the different cases. And then let's say I roll back to this commit here. My file is correctly reset to the, to the correct case. So those are the sort of main highlighted changes of, uh, that have happened to version control in IntelliJ IDEA 2016.2. Next up, let's cover some of the inspection changes. So mainly the tool window around inspections has been redesigned and you'll notice this as soon as you run the first, the first set of inspections. If I look at my inspection results here, so I've already been through the process of saying analyze, inspect code, and picking a profile to inspect. And these are my results here, this is fairly familiar. But now when you click on one of these things, you'll see here the, the code, the whole code area around that inspection violation. And so this allows me to do a number of different things. I can either apply the suggested change here, I can suppress this inspection for the statement or the method or the class. I can go in here and manipulate the code if I want to. So I can do replace with lambda here, or if I want, I can navigate directly to the code and take a look at the code in the context 
text to the whole file like I used to be able to. This is just quite a nice quick way to be able to go through your inspection results and, and apply the changes if you want to. I found this particularly useful when I'm trying to migrate some of my code to, uh, to Java 8, for example. I'm using the Java language, Java language level migration aids quite a lot to see which one of these inspections um, I can apply. Um, there's also a new inspection. This it's usually new inspections in most new versions of, of the IDE. They tend to pop up and you don't, one doesn't really keep up to date and notice them. So let's have a look at this new inspection. Here I can actually apply a filter to find out which new inspections have appeared in the latest version. I'm running the 2016.2.1 EAP, um, so that's the version that I've got here. But let's say I want to have a look at the new inspections in 2016.2. This is a new inspection which lets you know if you're creating new objects inside methods like equals, hash code, compare to, um, because these methods are used regularly, particularly inside collections and so forth. So if you are creating a brand new object inside the equals method, for example, you might be incurring a significant penalty hit. So by enabling this, by enabling this inspection and running that inspection, you might find some places where you can get some performance quick wins. So those are the kind of main key areas for inspections. And I was just taking a look to see if there are any more questions. I think I'll pause for questions after the next section. Okay. So next up, some changes around the editor. We have some noticeable changes like breadcrumbs for Java, we have support for ligatures, and we have some more support for writing regular expressions. You might have noticed I enabled breadcrumbs up here in the top in the top bar here. You can see wherever I'm wherever my cursor is, it tells me which class I'm in and which method I'm in. And this may seem sort of fairly simple in a case like this where I'm just in a in a method inside a class. But once we start getting into nested classes, let's have a look at those tests we were looking at early on. For a start, when we're inside a, let's minimize the buttons. When we're inside a Lambda expression, then we can see which method we're in and the fact that we're in a Lambda. We can, if we go to that nested class, where we have a top level class, an inner class, and a method, then our breadcrumbs tell us exactly where we are in each of these cases. So this is something you might want to choose to turn on, particularly with complex code or code that extensively uses things like Lambda expressions. Uh, or you can turn it off by, I'm using um, find action to turn it off. But actually, you can just go into settings, editor, general appearance, and turn off show breadcrumbs. So that, that way you can toggle it on or off. Another nice change that's happened is if we go to somewhere that uses Lambda expressions, Java code, here we've got a couple of Lambda expressions inside the stream. In my settings, I can enable I can enable font ligatures. You know, I have to select a font that supports font ligatures, like, for example, uh, this one or this one. So I have to know which of my fonts supports ligatures. But if I pick one of these and then enable it, what you'll see is your lambda expressions get turned into proper arrows. Things like not equals get turned into the mathematical symbol and so forth. And, and this is just a rendering thing, so we should be able to see if I type mood not equal, then you can see it just gets converted straight to the, the new representation. Under the covers, it's exactly the same thing. It's just being rendered in a slightly different way. This might be something that you prefer to use if you're using a more functional style of programming or if it's just something that, that makes you feel more comfortable. I'm going to turn that off for now so I can remember which font I was on. 
in fact you can see if I've if I've got this enabled but I've, I'm using the default font then you won't see you won't see the arrows and the pretty equals or not equal signs and the final change in, in the final new thing in the editors is more improvements to helping you write regular expressions so I'm not sure about you guys, but I always have to look up um, how to use regular expressions, and IntelliJ IDEA has a bunch of things to help us do this. So let me give you an example regular expression. There I've just used um, a cheat so that I didn't have to type it out manually to make sure I got it right. Um, so let's say we've got a regular expression like this. Now we get um, auto, we get code completion for the groups that I've put in the regular expression. So I can get auto completion, code completion on the group name. If I use that and I've done something wrong, as I have done in this case, then I'm getting some I'm getting errors reported to me to tell me what I've done wrong with this regular expression. I can also, um, of course, I can also check my regular expression and put in some example code, to, some example text to see whether I can get a match or not. Let's roll that back because I put an error in there on purpose. Okay, so next up is there are some small changes to the UI that you might notice. There's been some changes to notifications and the ability to add background image. Notifications, I was sort of expecting that a notification might pop up at some point during uh, me using the UI, but it, it hasn't so far. But you'll find that notifications are now popping up in the bottom right hand corner in a little balloon instead of in the top right corner. And you can configure what gets what gets popped up and what is just a silent, a silent um, either piece of information or error. And you might I see one of these things pop up as as I go throughout this. Usually it's it's errors, especially on the on some of the more unstable bits and pieces. Um, but what is quite interesting is the ability to add a back, background image. Here I might want to do, use oh, I've used the wrong thing. I'm going to do find action to look for a background image, and I can navigate to a background image. And let's pick something. So if I want to customize the way that my UI looks, then I can add a background image and I can do things like tweak the tweak how opaque it is to see just how readable the code is with that image on underneath it. Uh, and the other way that you can do this, so I got here by using find action to navigate to background image. If you have an image, for example, uh, an image here. I can also right click this and I can set it as background image if I want to. So that's just a nice way to to tweak the way that UI, your UI looks just for your own personalization. So that's kind of the set of basic across the board changes. You probably, as mentioned, you'll see some of these changes popping up in the other IDEs like PyCharm and so on and so forth. Are there any more questions at this point? Um, so far we have just one question about version control support. Um, um, the question is about whether the new VCS features only for Git or SVN as well. Uh, Basically, um, the log improvements available only for Git, and I believe all the rest, uh, uh, all the rest should work for SVN as well. Yeah, and of course, uh, use case only renames also work only for Git. Yeah, I think that's okay. it. Thanks. Thanks for that. So the next two main areas. Oh yes, the so Spring. Uh, I mentioned that Spring, there is a webinar to cover the Spring specific features. There's, uh, there's basically so much Spring stuff in there that it deserves its own webinar. That is on this Monday, this coming Monday. So I'm not going to cover any of those features in this in this webinar. Um, but what I am going to cover next, there are two main areas that I need to cover now. One is the changes to integrating with the database, and the second is around a lot of the JavaScript improvements. So let's move straight on and look at some of the changes to the database database tools. Um, here's where you can see quite a, a, a number of new features have been implemented. So I won't read through all of these right now. I will step through them and demo them as we go. 
So let me find me let me find a project with the database um, integration. So firstly, one of the things that's been added is uh, code completion, auto completion around database names when we add a data source. So let me add a new data source here. Oh, sorry. Here I can see that I get a list of all the databases which I can use for this database connection. I can test that and add that. That's just a kind of useful thing to make sure we don't get any uh, any mistyping errors around database names. In fact, this version of IntelliJ has quite a few um, nice improvements to the way the auto uh, the way you, the code completion works in a number of different areas, particularly around databases. So it gives you a lot more help. Next up is so something that will be familiar to us from. Let me open this back up again. So in projects, when we're looking at code and so on and so forth, you may have the option to auto scroll to source, auto scroll from source, something that we, we might use on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, that's now available for us in the databases window. So I can use auto scroll from editor. If I enable that, then when I select something in the editor, then the correct table or routine or whatever will be highlighted on the right hand side here. Or if I decide to turn that off, I can always do that by, I can always do that manually by pressing the um, uh, scroll from editor button in the top right hand corner here. So I was talking a bit about code completion. Let's open up one of my consoles. Now, if I'm if I'm typing out a SQL statement, oops, when it's expecting a table name, then the auto completion will only suggest perhaps table names. So I can have uh, animals.species or plants.species. It won't suggest things like the routines or anything else which is not appropriate for this place. So this, that just makes the, auto, the code completion just a little bit more helpful and a little bit less noisy. And something else is that we now have surround with function. Let me show you an example. So let's just set this up so we've got a reasonable example. So let's say we have something like this with a number of different um, a number of different columns we want to select. If I have something like, I can even have multi-cursor here, I can apply surround with function. And as well as that, if I type in the sort of camel case, if you like, the, the acronym version of a routine name, it will suggest that. So I can type in PDS and I get pretty display string there. So I can select that and, and that gets applied to both of those things. So that just again, it's just another thing which helps us, um, which helps us to write these things without having to do quite as much code, quite as much typing as in the past. Another area where we get some completion, which should help us, is in the values of tables. So if we add a row here, let's say this is number six, when I start typing B. I can get some completion here. So it will offer me the options that begin with B that were already there if I want to use those, or I can or I can select a new one if I want to. And another thing which is quite useful is we don't have to use the mouse as much, which is always a, always a goal of IntelliJ Ideas, the ability to use keyboard shortcuts where possible. Um, so now we can resize columns using um, command shift and arrows or shift control and arrows for Windows and Linux. 
finally, around the database integration, is a number of different options, a number of different features to help uh, if you're using Postgres as your database. So, firstly, the ability to edit uh, range types like this. Also, the ability to edit times with a time zone. And finally, if we open up one of these consoles, we can add we can add schemas and um, databases to our search path. So let's say we add this to our search path, and then we can we can reorder this as well. So if I move this to the top of the search path, then options from this table are going to appear above the other options, or I can remove that from there. And then as I'm typing something. It gives me the different options of plants or animals. I can see there are a couple of questions around the database integration, so perhaps we'll take those now before we move on to anything else. Um, yep, there are a couple of questions. First, are these uh, database features going to be available in data group? Yeah. Uh, data group is out and all the features shown here available there as well. Um, another question, whether um, code and assistance available for stored pr procedures and triggers. And um, some, um, for some databases, it is supported already now, so you can open a uh, stored procedure or a trigger for uh, editing. But for some, it may not be supported, uh, so it depends. Um, but I uh, expect uh, all the databases uh, supported, uh, I believe, in future releases. So, so it depends. If you see something not working, just uh, report to our track and, and we'll get it uh, working. And um, one more question about support for DynamiceDB. Uh, it's not supported yet, and, and it's it's not a SQL database, right? Uh, we do have plans for supporting no SQL database, but not not in the nearest future. But definitely, we'd like to have have it uh, in data group and IntelliJ IDEA based IDs. And finally, one more question, but it's not about database, but uh, it is about Gradle integration. Uh, unfortunately, uh, the question is whether uh, there are any improvements uh, regarding debugging Gradle tasks. Um, I, I, I'm afraid I can't answer it now, and but I'll make, uh, sh yeah, I'll, I'll try to cover it in follow-up email. So yeah, stay tuned. Let's let's it. Okay, great. Let's move on to the JavaScript changes then. Again, like the database changes, there's been a, a number of different JavaScript changes. And of course, JavaScript is a wide umbrella of, of different sorts of technologies these days. So um, I will demonstrate some by jumping between a number of different projects, some of the additions that we've got for, for supporting JavaScript. So firstly, around ECMAScript, let's see what we've got here. So we, in ECMAScript 6, IntelliJ IDEA can suggest converting callback functions into arrow functions. So this basically, for me as a, as a mostly Java person, this works very similarly to the way that the anonymous inner classes can get converted to lambdas uh, in Java. And so there you go, it just converts you to an arrow function. If, for example, as well, you had a slightly longer form one, it also offers you the option of converting these longer form ones into a shorthand one. Okay, so that's that's a new feature that's been added in IntelliJ IDEA 2016.2. Um, another thing that's been added is the postfix completion has been has been bulked up a little bit. I don't know if you use postfix completion. It's something that, that I've been getting to grips with a little bit in the Java world, um, but it allows you to you can add. Uh, you can mistype things. 
um, instead of having to go back to the beginning of a line of code, the idea is to allow you to continue typing in order to do things. So for example, we supported before the ability to turn something into a var um, by typing dot var. And now in this version, oh my goodness, I've got to, I've got clumsy fingers going all over the place. Um, in this version, I can also turn this into a const if I want to. Uh, let's call this version. Or I can also turn things into uh, a let if I so choose. So let's call that template. So this is just the postfix, postfix completion is just a nice way to allow you to continue the flow. So instead of having to move your cursor backwards and forwards, you can do dot something and there's some shortcuts which allow you to do common features and that, that applies to Java and JavaScript and a bunch of other places. Um, so that's for the ECMAScript features. Uh, let's move on to React features. So here I have a comment box where I've defined my improp types like title and author. Now when I start actually using this comment box, uh, IntelliJ IDEA will allow me to, it will provide with completion those title and author prop types. So I, uh, I get some nice safe code completion there. A couple of other changes here. Um, the component lifecycle methods, things like component did mount and a number of others, um, they don't show as unused anymore. In previous versions of IntelliJ, these are showing as unused, which was a bit misleading. So now these get shown as being correctly used as part of the framework. And another thing is the React specific attribute types are supported. So some of these are things like key and, um, and my personal favorite, which is dangerously set in HTML. Um, I love anything which uh, invokes the sense of danger. So these are now supported with part of the uh, auto-completion inside IntelliJ IDEA if you're, if you're working with React. And the final area here is if I'm using an event like on click, um, the code completion will give me curly braces instead of giving me quotes. So that's just quite a nice feature to allow me to not have to keep going back and delete things or, or change things. Uh, moving on to Angular 2 support, we've now got some new live template support for Angular 2. So I could do something like, say, ng2 component, um, and that would just give me all the template stuff. So again, as per usual, just trying to minimize the amount of typing that we have to do. So I can now just do, just navigate directly from from thing to thing to wherever I want to be. Another new feature is the support for let inside structural directives. So if I have something like, um, let's say I've got a div and I've got uh, ng4, what have I done wrong here? Um, then I can put a let in here and that'll get properly supported inside, uh, inside IntelliJ IDEA. Item of items. And the final thing around, um, around Angular support is if I'm creating a new project, then I can use the yeah, I can use Angular CLI. So I'm selecting a static web. I can use Angular CLI to create a new project as long as you've got Angel the Angular CLI set up and installed on your machine. So once again, just a few bits and pieces just to make your life a little bit easier around, around working with some of these JavaScript frameworks. The, the last thing here is, is around build configurations. So now what I can do, let's remove this one. What I can do is on, on a run or debug configuration, I can now add um, grunt gulp or MP, grunt or gulp tasks or npm scripts um, to run before I launch something else. So say for example, I here I'm running start. There might be some particular thing I want to run before I do that every single time. So I might want to compile my CSS or I might want to uh, run a specific task, and I can do that for any grunt or gulp task here. So I could say, let's say SAS there. 
Um, and then that will run every time I every time I decide to run that particular build or run, um, run configuration. The last thing, it's not JavaScript, kind of falls into the web front end side of things, is configuration settings for HTML. So now when you're configuring HTML, so I'm in obviously settings preferences, editor, HTML, I can decide whether my generated quote marks are single, double, or I don't have any. So this just should make life a little bit easier when you're striving for consistency in your HTML code. That, um, that pretty much covers the main things I wanted to talk about. Now we have plenty of time to cover either any remaining questions around the sections we just covered just now, or any general questions around IntelliJ IDEA. Uh, thanks, Trisha, for a nice presentation. Uh, so far, we have just one more question. It is about um, Angular uh, CLI, uh, whether it is, whether its UI looks the same as for Grunt and Gulp. Um, the, the only UI Angular CLI provides is actually Project Wizard. Uh, and I'm not really sure I uh, got the question. So if you if you could re rephrase it, uh, yeah, we'll try to answer that. Um, but basically, Angular CLI uh, is just uh, an option the Project Wizard uh, offers, and no other UI available in inside the ID. One more question uh probably it's a uh, continuation of uh, this question about angular cli so that for instance i click a button to link the project um sorry uh, still still um still not not um not fully understand it just just but no no, no worries just send it send it to post it to Twitter or send it, um, post it as a comment to the blog post where we'll publish the recording and we'll try to answer that. Sure, or ask any questions to me, um, Trisha, Trisha underscore G E E at on Twitter. Ah, just, I, I, mean, I, I meant to put that on the end slide and I forgot. <laughs> yeah, and there were more questions coming out. Uh, one more question. Is it possible to replace idea build project with Gradle? So that is invoked on hotkeys as well as build project actions triggered elsewhere. Mm. Um, if I understood correctly, the question is uh, whether it is possible to remap the shortcuts. So instead of build project, make project, you could invoke uh, compile task in Gradle. I believe it is possible. So you you, you, you de definitely can change, change, remove the shortcut from make the project and assign a new one for any task uh, Gradle provides. Yeah, I think that's it. And uh, if if you have more questions, just yeah, feel free to ask them in Twitter or publish them uh, as a comment to the recording. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's it. Uh, so thank you, Trisha, for presentation, and thank thank everyone for your time and for your questions. Take care and have a good day.